All of us, as we were born in families, our parents began to teach us things like how to pee, how to go to the bathroom, even after we are done, how to wipe our behind. Simple things like that, uh, how to use, if you grew up from Asian families, use the chopsticks, table manners, and how to watch out, passing cars, and so forth. Many things, trivial and important things, we learn. Then we begin to go to schools, and our teachers begin to teach us, not only academically, but also things that are pertaining to society. And also we learn from others, from other friends. And then we come to church, and then we learn other important spiritual principles. But among these learnings, one thing that is so important in our Christian life, and also in life general, but rarely, any parents will have their children sit down on the table and seriously talk about. But this is a such important spiritual principle that will either lead our life to destruction or success and victorious Christian life. What will be this topic? That topic is a topic of authority, understanding authorities. Unfortunately, Growing up in America and living in America, demographic democracy is not helping us, especially in the kingdom of heaven. Because the kingdom of God, church life, is a theocracy, not democracy. God rules, God governs. So for us, living in demographic world is not easy for us to understand Authority. Another reason why we have a hard time understanding authorities is because authority is abstract and it's invisible. Another reason we have a hard time understanding authority is because of our sinful, fallen nature. Our pride, our arrogance, our self, and our ego repair against authorities. In our society, in our culture, somehow rebellion and challenging authorities are beautified in the movies or by the talk of friends because you are entitled to share your opinions and everyone is entitled to have a feeling. And because of that, when we talk about authority and hierarchy, we repel them and we dislike them. However, that no matter how smart you may be, and how talented, how well-educated, how capable you may be, if we don't have a proper understanding of authorities and how to deal with authorities, that we may not excel in this life, especially in the kingdom of God, because we may end up being the people with the great potentials, but never be useful for his glory and for his kingdom. And that's why this teaching and authority is not only necessary, but it's so vital if you and I want to lead a successful and victorious Christian life, and also particularly if we want to be used by God powerfully for his glory and for his kingdom purpose. Apostle Paul, as we know, in the book of Romans from chapter 1 through 8, he laid down the solid foundation and theology of salvation of God, the righteousness of God, has been imputed to upon us by the grace of God in the faith of Jesus Christ, only by propitiation of the blood of Jesus Christ. And with this doctrine of the salvation in Christ Jesus, he laid up to chapter 8. Then he talked about mysterious salvation plan, not only for the Gentiles, but Jews included from chapter 9 through 11. 
So up to 11, he talked about theories. He talked about doctrines. He talked about theology and the gospel. Then from chapter 12 to last chapter, chapter 16, he is talking about practical application of what we have learned. If we truly and properly understand the gospel, then it may be exercise in our daily living with the practical applications. Because the gospel not only is heard and gave us eternal life, but here on earth, it must be lived out properly. Because you and I are the churches of Jesus Christ. And here on earth, they are not able to see risen Christ. Because he sits on the throne of God right now. And they are only able to see you and I as a reflection of who Jesus is. So in that practical teachings, many things are mentioned. Do not repay evil with the evil, but with the good. Love your enemies and serve them and give your body as a living sacrifices and so forth. And along with it, then we come to chapter 13, then... Apostle Paul talks about how you as a Christians, both Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, living in Rome, you must be subject to the governing authorities. If you and I were Christians back then, 2,000 years ago, in Rome, as a Christians, you would say, what? Because the time Apostle Paul was writing this letter to the Christians in Rome, was under Roman Empire regime, most likely the emperor was that notorious, brutal, cruel Nero. And he's talking about governing authorities. The Christians must be subject to all these authorities because every single authority comes from Heavenly Father. And if you reject and repair and rebel against any governing authorities, you are directly rebelling against your God. Wow, that's a very strong statement. And especially we as American Christians living in this demographic society, this is at least a favorite topic that we want to talk about. And that's why you rarely hear this. But this is so important. If we want to be used by God in his kingdom and glorify his name and lead a life that is influential to the society, to the nations, and other people, we must not only properly understand authorities, but also be submissive to such authorities and also Every one of us, to a certain degree, God has endowed the spiritual authority upon you and I. And we must learn how to handle and utilize spiritual authority. Because I, as a lead pastor, without spiritual authority, I cannot serve you, I cannot lead you, I cannot lead this ministry. And this is a gift from God. God is the originator, generator of all authorities. And depending upon how we understand authority, how we treat authority, and how we handle authority, our lives will be so much different. For my 30 years of Christian experience, I've seen so many cases, seen brothers and sisters, great potential, smart, educated, talents, gifted, but because of their ego and their pride, unwilling to yield to human delegated authorities, their potential was cut short. And it's heartbreaking. But you and I, we want to properly understand the authorities and be really be obedient to God and to his delegated authorities so that God may continually use us for his glory and for his kingdom. So let's turn our Bible to the book of Romans chapter 13 from verse 1 through 8. Verse 1, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. 
Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority to what is good, and you will have a praise from the same? For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all that are due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Oh, no, oh, no one, anything, anything except, except to, to love, love one, one another, another for, for he who loves another has fulfilled, fulfilled the, law. the law. Apostle Paul simply makes this spiritual principle and statement that every soul, without exception, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. There is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. In our human eyes, there can be some delegated authorities who don't deserve such authority. Their lifestyle, their conduct, they seem to be evil, and they also abuse their authorities. And that's why every one of us in this room, if we are honest, we are wounded by delegated authorities. It makes it harder for us to be subjected to the delegated authority. But that doesn't justify our disobedience. That doesn't justify our rebellion against human authorities. Because God is the originator of all authorities. He is the giver of authorities. So first lesson we must understand and embrace is this. God sits on the throne of authority, not of power. Let me repeat it. God sits on the seat or throne of authority, not of power. What makes the difference? Authority in Greek is exousia, uh, something like that. It's authority, exousia. And then power is a dunamis, where dynamite is coming from. So the someone who has authority can perform powerful deeds. And our God is all-powerful because he sits on the throne, highest throne, with the highest authority, but not of power. What does this teach us? That means regardless of his performing power or not in our life, we are called to obey him in all times. Because if our notion is that God is sitting on the throne of power, not authority, then our obedience to him will be fluctuating continually. When God answers my prayers, when God performs the power in my personal life, then I'm thankful to him and I will obey him. But he sits on the throne of authority. Sometimes he's a silent. Sometimes he doesn't perform powerful deeds and miracles in my life. Sometimes he delays answering my prayers. Regardless how he is, regardless how he deals with me, I am standing or kneeling before his throne and I'm called to obey him. Because he sits on the seat of highest throne. Now, that principle applies to human delegated authorities. Why? You know why we have a hard time obeying our human leaders? Because we evaluate their power, not the authority. Because as long as my husband is good for me, as long as my husband makes money and provides for my family, then I'll all obey him. As long as my husband is gentle, as long as my pastor knows the Bible more than I, as long as my house church prays more than I, so we evaluate their performance and decide whether to obey them or not. That's utterly wrong. It doesn't matter. We talk about in America, positional leadership and relational re leadership. When we are under authority, it doesn't matter 
whether you should be relational leaders or positional leader, you honor sovereignty of God, God's choice of that person over your life, and you are required to be subject to him, regardless of his performance, regardless of his capacity, regardless of his morality. That's why we have a hard time obeying our delegated authorities because we try to evaluate their power. We try to evaluate their capacity. We try to evaluate and discern their ability and decide and justify our disobedience. Absolutely wrong. That's not biblical. Because God sits on the seat of authority, not power. So whether God answers my prayer or not, whether he performs good deeds in my life or not, we are to obey him all the time. That's why so many Christians wrestle with obedience because they try to see how good God is in their personal life, then decide to obey or disobey. And that's why our obedience is fluctuating, depend upon how God deals with me. Then we don't understand true sovereignty. We don't understand true authority. Second aspect we can understand about this is that even though God sits on the highest throne and we understand our God is a triune God, in that trinity, there is also order of authority. There's a hierarchy. Because there's a Father God, there's a Son, Jesus Christ, and there's a Holy Spirit. And there's a hierarchy of their authority. However, their virtue, their attribute, their power are all equal, whether he is a Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. However, in that Trinity, there's a perfect harmony with that higher of authority. How do we know that? From the Scripture. Because of the Bible, Jesus himself said in the book of John chapter 13, verse 16, he said, Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is a saint greater than he who sent him. Sender is a greater than those who are being sent. So that's why, in a way, sending church has a greater authority than those missionaries who are being commissioned. Because if the father sent his son to the earth, father is a greater than the son Jesus Christ. Jesus perfectly obeyed his father, even though he was a perfect God. Nothing lacking compared to his father. He utterly obeyed his father because the father has a higher authority. And Jesus also said, when I return back to the father, I will send you another comforter, Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit was a subject to the son Jesus Christ. So there's a hierarchy. In perfect harmony, they reign the entire world. If trying God has that hierarchy of authority, and he rules in that order. God is not God of confusion, but God is God of order. The society, your movies, whatever people may say to us, we abide in the scriptures. Another aspect about understanding God sits on the highest authority is this. Whatever he says takes highest authority. That's why in our Christian church, we take the Bible, the highest authority, over subjective experience of hearing the voice of Holy Spirit. Because it's a written word of God. Out of the mouth of God who sits on the highest throne, his words takes highest authority. That's why however you feel, however the culture says, however I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit, and when I examine with the written word of God, I must be subject to everything. That's why even this word asking us to be subject to all governing authorities. Yes, I know there's an impulse coming up from your heart as you listen to this message. With our sinful nature, we repel against that, but this is the word of God. And God says, if you resist the authority, you resist directly the ordinance of God. God takes it personally. 
Because every authority, God originated and given to that person. And when we resist that authority, repel and rebel against it, we are rebelling against God directly and invoke his judgment over our lives. At least he's a discipline. From my Christian experience as a spiritual leader, I see this all the time. So much of potential upon that brother, upon that sister. They don't understand authority because they are still bound by worldly teaching of democracy, sharing your opinion, what you logically think is right, and you resist and repel, and you condemn your leadership, and your life will not go any further as far as a spiritual growth is concerned. I've seen so many things. Times. God is a disciplining. When they repel and resist and disobey their authority in their life, I can clearly see God's disciplinary actions and hands over them. But realities, I cannot tell them. Because I'm obeying the book of Proverbs. Do not reprove a foolish man because you're going to either cry or laugh. But many cases, I wish they can learn the lesson, but they don't. And if they don't, and I sin for the rest of their lives, they're stuck right there because they're unwilling to submit, unwilling to break their ego. Oh, yes, they're talented. They're gifted. Yes, they're smart, educated. But that's as far as they can go. Now, This God, from his throne, he rules the entire universe, both his kingdom and also this world, by partially taking his authority to human leaders, whether in the federal government, kings and queens, presidents, police, military, uh, in the school, teachers and all that, in civil area of life, and also in his church, the pastors, the senior pastors and all that. There is a structure. There is an order. If God himself pre-existed through eternity in that order, do you think God would violate himself in this world? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So all of us probably are connected with the three spheres of our life. In civil life, that can be our career, And then there's a family, and there's an order in the family. And there's a church, and it is a kingdom. And in all three spheres of authorities, that we must understand how God operates. So first, civil life, or career, that you're career. And when you go there, you have a bosses. You have an upper management. You are called to be subject to them. Dependent upon each company's culture, they may open up for your opinions, share your ideas. That's all good. But when your boss makes a final decision to dislike, you dislike, you are called to be submissive to that man. Otherwise, you are not a good representation of who Jesus is. Because Jesus, if we truly understand the gospel, gospel happened because the son fully obeyed the calling of the father. If he disobeyed, there's no gospel. So if we carry the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere we go, we must recognize the delegated authority and be subject to such. Otherwise, we misrepresent the gospel. The Bible says, and our prophet Paul said in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 5, One servant, be obedient to those who are your masters, according to the flesh, with a fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart, as to Christ. During those times, 2,000 years ago, in Roman Empire, once you become slave, for life you are slave. It was almost impossible for you to get out of that status. But here, We live in a society, you can choose your master, you can choose your boss. So if you are in truly toxic environment and you are not exit out because you are unwilling to yield, but you truly discern this is a toxic and corrupted working environment, quietly exit out. Don't be unfair 
that you continually rebel and disobey in the workplaces and complain about the leadership, and that is not good representation of who Christ is. And don't tell them you are from Grace Church. Tell them you are from church from, I don't know, somewhere out in the orbit. Second spear of authority God has put is a family. I know, again, culturally, this is so against today's culture. But let's hear what the Apostle Paul says in the family setting. In the 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, God says, But I will have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is Is God right there? Higher of authority. Head of Christ is God. God is above Jesus Christ. And head of man is Jesus Christ. And head of women, I'm sorry, sisters, but it is a truth, is man. And that's why in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 22, God commanded, Wives, submit to your own husbands. As a, to the Lord, for the house, husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. In everything in Christ. What Jesus is saying is when you become subject to your own husbands, you are directly obeying Jesus Christ. And then, the reason why wives have such a hard time obeying their husband is, look at my husband. He's not godly. He doesn't pray as much as I do. Look at him. He always com- plays a computer games, watches a sneakers game. Why do I need to obey him? You wrestle. You fight back. You rebel and be disobedient, and your life will be miserable. So many wives disregarding this mandate from God himself in their lives, they're not happy. They think they're smarter. They think by living that way, repelling, and just continually fighting against their husband, and peace is gone, joy is taken, and they're unhappy, and they push their husbands away, and husbands will have such a hard time loving them, the rebellious wives. And they become so passive and retreated, and you wonder why, and you continually condemn your husbands. When, for the fact is, you are unwilling to abide in God's word. Not fair. Not fair. Yeah, it sounds not fair. But listen carefully. In Christ, in everything, And when you obey, Jesus takes your obedience. Now your husband becomes accountable before Christ. That's the wisdom. The reason why you cannot obey your husband is because you cannot trust that Jesus Christ. Because when you obey your husband, your Jesus takes it. And with a changed mind of your husband, or grow him, mature him, break him, whatever you do. But as long as you take ownership in this relationship and you go what the culture says, you're going to not only be miserable, your husband will be continually further pushed away and you'll be miserable and Jesus will take hands off from your marriage. Okay, you want to go your way? Go ahead, try it. Go ahead, your way. But by obeying, Jesus becomes responsible over your marriage. Single sisters, listen carefully. It's all good you fall in love with a guy. But think before you say I do or yes to his proposal. Because for the rest of your life, God requires you to be submissive to this guy. Is he? ready for your submission. You can all love him with your emotion, but that's reality. 
That's a reality. But those are people who already are married, praise God, stick through with him because your husbands, their guys, don't smile too much. Because we are called to love them as Christ loved the church and gave his life for the church. Whether they are rebelling against you, disobedient, we are to endure them, love them until the end, crucifying our ego. I don't know which one is a harder commandment. <laughs> Likewise in the family, because authority is abstract, abstract and invisible, children learn the authority and obedience by looking at the mother, how mother obeys his, their dad. And also, children are required to obey their parents. Listen, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Takunon, little children. So here's the principle. Obedience to our parents is until the marriage. And that's why single brothers and sisters, no matter what you say, you saw him in your dream, God spoke to you, and stars fell upon your lap, and stars danced and said, that guy is your husband, but your parents say, no, you need to wait and pray for them. Because without their approval and blessing, you cannot justify this marriage is from the Lord. Because you are called to obey them until the marriage, but honor them for life. Why? Because the Bible says, the man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and become one flesh. Then, through the marriage, you become the head of the household. You become independent family. And your parents continually can give you advices, but you are not bound to obey them all. Because sometimes their advice may not truly help your marriage and your family. You can kindly, respectfully reject them. Because we are called to honor them for the rest of our lives. God is a God of order, not God of confusion. And then there's a third sphere that is our church that belongs to the kingdom of God. And you think because a church should be full of grace and people becoming lenient, absolutely not. There is an order. Because you cannot serve two masters. In every local church, there's a lead pastor, head pastor, and God will entrust his flock under his care. All other associate pastors are called to assist him. Assist him. They're not the leaders. Because if you have two heads that are monsters, and the followers will be utterly confused. In the local church of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, James was the pastor. It was very clear from the book of Acts. Even chapter 15, Peter, Paul, Barnabas will all share their, what they think about how Gentiles are to abide in the law or not. Finally, James stood up, made a final decision, period, because he was a lead pastor. You have no idea how many times, against my liking, against what I think will be better, I will be subject to Pastor Hunt because he is my delegated authority. And my humility is continually checked in balance with him. Just last week, you know, a couple of weeks later during the Passion Week, our all kids, they go to Eastside Christian School, and it's their spring break. And I wanted to take him to San Francisco for a few days. So I asked Pastor Han, Pastor Han, kids are on the break, and so can I take her during the midweek, not even weekends, midweek for a few days to San Francisco. And he said, that's a passion week. In the KM, we have a special early morning prayer. You should also do a special early morning prayer for the EM. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> that's the end of it. That's why it was not even the video announcement because it was made just a few days ago that we're going to have a special early morning prayer. Holy Spirit will fall upon us. Come in the morning. <laughs> and I know sometimes when you hear such a message, you think that's a cultural. 
Ah, such Korean message. You think so? I encourage you to read the classic books on authority and obedience, Undercover by John Bavier. Thank God he's a white American Christian. He talks about this. Such good book. He began to learn about authority and obedience when he was serving as a youth pastor in Orlando, Florida, in mega church, international ministry. First time becoming youth pastor, he diligently read the books, how to grow youth ministries and so forth. He found a church in Louisiana that was thriving. Over 1,000 high schoolers, high school alone, went there. And the clue was Friday night, they had a small parties. Or youth. So non-believing high schoolers will come to this small parties and that was a platform and there they shared the gospel. And they came. He came back to Orlando, excited. Small group is the key. On Fridays, and they, he began to teach youth, youth leaders, 24 of them, selected for eight months. He prepared the manual, trained them. And one day during the staff meeting, his senior pastor will go, Holy Spirit says our church is not for small groups. Boom. A month, six months ago in the parking lot, I told you, senior pastor, you said, go for it, John. All these, he rested. He was not able to obey him. Chided him. But later, Holy Spirit began to unfold. You may win all high schoolers in the city of Orlando, but when the judgment day comes, I will ask you how you were accountable, be obedient to your senior pastor, because during that time, that was your calling. Another book, A Tale of Three Kings, talking about King Saul, King David, and King Absalom. King Saul, he did not understand God's authority, utterly disobeyed. And Absalom rebelled against authority, his own father. Two men, utterly, their lives were destroyed, and their kingdoms as well. Only David. When you look at King Saul, his morality, he was disobedient. His anointing was already subsided. Everything, you can justify why you need to disobey him. But David understood God's sovereignty and authority, submitted, and he still stands as a man after God's own heart. Brothers and sisters, we may be so talented, we may be even anointed, but unless we properly understand authority and what we are called, before delegated authority, we're not going to thrive. We're not going to bring impact to the kingdom of God. God cannot use us. Because God doesn't need our opinion. He needs our obedience. And through our obedience, he reveals his glory and power. The last question I want to ask us is this. Without spiritual authority, we cannot bring impact to his kingdom. Without spiritual authority, we cannot raise the disciples of Jesus Christ. Spiritual authority is a gift from God. However, spiritual authority is not freely given to us. Salvation is given by grace and grace alone in Christ Jesus. However, spiritual authority that is so needed in the kingdom of heaven is earned by three things. First, by humility. Second, by submission. Third, by surrender. In my personal Christian life, for the past 30 years, I have observed two Christian men with a great spiritual authority, Pastor Kim and Pastor Han. They do possess great spiritual authority. Pastor Kim, our founding pastor, he taught in the beginning series on obedience and authority. This is one of the reasons why this church bore so much fruit in the mission field. Because they were trained to understand authorities and obey them. Pastor Kim, his leadership style, harako, just do it. 
and they obey. He doesn't even say it twice. He doesn't give an explanation. Just do it. Nike must pay him commission. <laughs> Got up, go, go, and they obey and went. Kazakhstan, Russia, and bore so much of fruit. Pastor Han, so different. Their leadership styles are so different. Pastor Han is much gentler, but don't be fooled by his gentleness. He carries the same authority. He may explain to you. That doesn't mean you can justify your disobedience. But all two of them, I observe humility, submission, and surrender. Let's hear what Jesus says in the book of Matthew chapter 20. Book of Matthew chapter 20. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. That's what the worldly rulers do, but not in the kingdom of God. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And also Peter said in the Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, Therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exhort you in due time. Humility induces greater spiritual authority. Through obedience, we earn greater spiritual authority. When we are fully surrendered, then God highly exalts us. And Jesus gave us a perfect example with a humility, with a submission to the Father and full surrender even to obedience to the cross of Calvary. That's why 2 Philippians chapter 2, first Philippians chapter 2, verse 8 and 10, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, humility, and became obedient, submission to the point of death, full surrender, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God. The Father, because of his humility, because of his full obedience, because of his surrender, God will exhort him and give him authority. Every tongue shall confess his Lord. Every knee shall bow before him. I believe this teaching is so displeasing to most of us. But our life's success and Christianity is dependent upon this teaching. Because after all, in the Garden of Eden, sin entered because they rebelled against God's authority and His word. And by going opposite direction, we invited the gospel and the gospel teaches us to be obedient to God. Every governing of authority is from the Lord. And when we obey them, we are obeying God directly. And our peace will be maintained. And our conscience will be freed. And joy will continue. And we will become useful servants of God for His glory, for the expansion of his kingdom. Let us arise. Would you observe your life? You've been justifying your disobedience and challenging authorities, left and right, because you are wounded by your own father. Father, who was your first authoritative figure, abused his authority, was not feeding in your own eyes. 
hurt them, hurt you. Perhaps he was distanced. Perhaps he was absent. Perhaps he was incompetent. Whatever reason might be, we are now look at our leaders' power and ability. Then we decide to obey them. No, we acknowledge God's sovereignty and His authority, and we submit to them. Forgive your fathers. Forgive those who have wounded you, who are in the authorities, misused authorities. Again, that doesn't justify your disobedience. Because at the end of the day, it's all your loss. Because you go against God and His words. Ask the Holy Spirit to come inside of your heart. Heal your wounds. But on our part, we need an action. We need a decision. We need to decide to forgive them and bless them and thank the Lord so that our hearts may be fully set free. One thing I want to remind you, because there is a limitation to the authority that is the scriptures. If any leader asks you things that are against written word of God, you are called to disobey them in order for you to obey God and His word. So don't worry if our hearts and motivation are acceptable before God. We can trust God because God is the one who takes our obedience and moves powerfully through our circumstances. One of the reasons why people have a hard time obeying their delegated authorities is because their low self-esteem is any ionic because authority is nothing to do with your identity or your self-worth. Of humanity. When I go before Pastor Han, I am not less worthy than him. I am not less a child of God than him. My identity, my worth in Christ never alters. Doesn't matter what kind of authorities we possess or are under. It's just acknowledging God's sovereignty and His authority. May I, my self-worth, identity never alters. But when we struggle with a low self-esteem and cannot truly understand our identity in Christ Jesus, we have a wrestling time obeying our authorities. Jesus knew who He was. He delightfully obeyed the Father. Because when we wrestle with a low self self esteem, we will choose to disobey. Because my pride cannot allow to obey this guy and that girl. As we worship the Lord, let's invite the Holy Spirit to examine our lives, any spears, whether in the career. Whether in the family, whether in the church, there has been perpetual disobedience. Let's repent and allow God also to heal us and set free and fully trust 